Hello, and welcome to the C19 Weekly. I'm your host, Nicholas Tatnetti, a professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. Each week, we go through some of the latest and most interesting data science and informatics papers um, on COVID and SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS COVID-19 research. This is for fans of data science everywhere. If you're not an expert in these fields, there's still something for you. I think you'll find these papers really interesting. We try to break them down in the simplest way possible. We wanna create a snapshot of what's going on, not look at every single paper that's coming out. There's thousands of papers coming out all the time. Uh, we wanna look at just those that are most interesting. So not a comprehensive review, just a few highlights. In this week's episode, we are going to be talking about a data-driven approach to drug discovery with some really cool molecular biology. We're talking about how to hijack yeast to mass produce virus, maybe not quite as scary as it sounds. And we're gonna be talking about llamas. They have finally joined the fight. We've been waiting for them and they have arrived. And a little project update from a project that we had highlighted a few weeks ago. So a data-driven approach to drug discovery. A SARS-CoV-2 protein interaction map reveals targets for drug repurposing. Gordon et al. published in Nature, April 30th, 2020. The goal here was to identify new therapeutic candidates through a deep molecular analysis of how the virus interacts with human cells. They cloned, tagged, and expressed 26 of the 29 SARS-CoV-2 proteins in human cells, and then identified through mass spectrometry uh, human proteins that physically interacted with those virus proteins. Basically, identify the targets of the virus so that we can use that information to potentially target those proteins to keep the virus from reproducing, from re replicating. They found, using this approach, 332 human interaction proteins, and they were able to link those to 69 drug leads. These are drugs that are already approved, drugs that are in the clinical trial pipeline, and many drugs that are not even in the clinical trial pipeline at all. This is the most detailed map we've gotten so far of how the virus interacts with the cells and hijacks the cells for their own uses. It's gonna go way beyond, the implication of this study will go way beyond just the drugs that they identify here. It will go into how the virus functions, how it hijacks the cell, exactly which machinery it needs and is dependent on, and that will reveal new therapeutic areas in a lot of different ways and really understanding how the virus works. So way beyond these just 69 potential drug leads. This is the analysis they did. They, they, call the, uh, they have these 27 bait proteins, which are the virus proteins. They ex uh, express them in hex cells, which are just a cell we use in the lab all the time. They're a kidney cell. They're really easy to grow and replicate. They're a good model just for human cells in general. And then they do this assay where they bind some uh, proteins to them and then pull them out. And that's how you know whether or not the two proteins are interaction, interacting. They were able to build a map of protein protein interactions using this approach. They did some enrichment analysis to identify which proteins are being targeted. So they were studying this in kidney cells. So the question is, well, is this just relevant for kidney cells or is it relevant for other tissues as well? The way to answer that question is to look at what's called a pathway enrichment analysis or a tissue enrichment analysis. What they found was that the proteins targeted by these viruses are enriched for proteins that are active in tissues like the lung, and that's their top one. So that adds some credibility to their findings. Without this, you might say, well, they're kidney cells. We don't really know if this is going to translate and if it's telling us something real. But with this, it gives you a little bit more confidence in their results. They also compare these results. On the right here, you can see this figure E. They compare these results to other viruses, and they show that there are some similarities and some very big differences. This is the protein interaction map, just part of the protein interaction map that they found. They find lots of interactions between human proteins and the viral proteins, and they were able to annotate them with their functions. That gives you some insight about maybe which functions are, are most important. You can see RNA processing, for example, has several different interactions associated with it. Probably means that RNA processing is pretty important for this RNA virus. In fact, um, they were able to use that specific one to uh, explain how one of their putative drugs might work. And so they have not only, this is the really cool part about this, not only can they say, oh, we put this drug in a cell and we noticed that their virus was inhibited, but they can go beyond that. And because they have this interaction map and because of taking advantage of other knowledge databases, they can go beyond that and say, this is the mechanism by which we think this drug is acting. We think it's inhibiting these specific proteins and it leads to uh, uh, inhibiting viral replication in these ways. And that's really important for understanding the biology of that's happening and not just looking at it 
from a high level. One thing that they found was that sigma R1 and sigma R2, these really two important proteins, were highly critical across the different classes of drugs that they identified. So it highlights the importance of these proteins. It might play a really central role. I just want to highlight that with this kind of uh, beautiful, beautiful Venn diagram they have over here. And then in a plot, they do test these experimentally, so they don't only just make predictions about what drugs might be effective, but they also test them experimentally. What you find is that the find these beautiful dose-dependent response curves, as you increase the dose of these drugs, you decrease the ability of the virus to replicate. They compared this. They also found um, that hyd uh, hydroxychloroquine, of course, we all know about that one. They found that it is also effective, but they found that these other compounds are 20 times more effective than hydroxychloroquine and perhaps don't have some of those associated side effects. They go into some detail. I encourage you to read the paper if you're curious about those as well. The one thing I will say before I jump into the next one is that anytime you're targeting human proteins, there's worry about toxicity. Viruses, if you target just viral proteins, are usually pretty different than human proteins and you're not as worried about toxicity. But because this paper is advocating for targeting the human proteins, that could be a concern in, for side effects in the future. All right, next thing we're going into, how to hijack yeast to mass produce viral genomes. Rapid reconstruction of SARS-CoV-2 using a synthetic genomics platform. Dao et al, Nature, April 24th, 2020. The goal of this study was to come up with an experimental way to replicate the genome of SARS-CoV-2 so that we could study it in more detail, so we'd have enough of it to study, basically. It's a relatively large genome, making current available tools to analyze and, and do that replication analysis, typically use E. coli. It's difficult for E. coli to produce this virus. So they were saying, well, we can use yeast, much bigger, has, has some nice features about the way it replicates its chromosomes, we can use yeast to mass produce this viral genome. Now, it sounds like a scary thing, but it's actually probably not as dangerous as it sounds. The, the virus that they're producing, the DNA um, that they're producing, is, is not by itself going to infect. It can't get loose and infect a whole bunch of people, but it can be used to infect cells if you do some certain really specific molecular biology techniques, and then you can use that to study the virus. They were able to do so. They hijacked yeast to synthesize the viral genome, and they showed that they can produce viable virus if it's treated in this very specific way. And this makes it possible to synthesize enough so that researchers all around the world can study the virus in full throttle. This is an overview of what they did. You can see that they used yeast to mass produce these. They transfect these yeasts. They uh, induce this uh, this kind of artificial chromosome in the yeast, which is really cool, and then the yeast can replicate that artificial chromosome. They can cut that out of the yeast and then infect a cell specifically, and they show that they can produce viable virus from that. Um, that's all that says, really. They also put this figure in, which is basically just a brag, where they show that they're able to do this extremely fast, and they put this timeline in saying that oh, they received the virus the first bits of the virus on February 5th, and by February 12th, they had used this system to produce the virus and produce a viable virus that can infect a cell. That's all this figure is. They tried this for other viruses as well. Not all of them succeed. So you can see here they have virus rescue on the right. Not all of them, um, well, I guess not all of them were attempted, but presumably not all of them succeed either. Okay, now what we've been waiting for. Llamas have finally joined the fight. Structural basis for potent neutralization of beta coronaviruses by single domain camelid antibodies. Rapid L, published in Cell, will be published in Cell, May 28th, 2020. The goal here is to explore whether beta coronavirus, these, uh, these antibodies derived from llamas, can neutralize SARS CoV 2, MERS CoV, and SARS CoV 1. They actually did not do an experiment with SARS CoV 2, they, they're relying on. Um, some cross-reactivity with SARS-CoV-1. We'll get into that a little bit. The method is to isolate antibodies, these really special antibodies from llamas, immunize, immunize for these viruses, and test whether or not that they can inhibit the activity of these viruses and prohibit infection. So these VHHs, what they called, which are these antibodies from the llamas, they neutralize MERS and SARS-CoV-1, and they hypothesized that cross-reactivity with SARS-CoV-2 will confer some protection there. 
It provides a molecular basis for the neutralization of pathogenic beta coronaviruses. Now, why llamas? Llamas are really cool. Llamas are cool because they have two types of antibodies where we only have one. They have one that's really like ours, and then they have this other one that's super tiny and small. And it, why, the reason why that's important is because it allows it to access parts of proteins that otherwise are inaccessible to our antibodies, for example, and they can be more effective. So this is their pipeline, infect a llama uh, or expose a llama to antigens, have it grow these antibodies, pull out these antibodies, see if they are protective. Uh, if we, treat, we can treat cells with these antibodies and, and it inhibits the growth and replication of the virus. These are some plots that show that that's the case. Basically, they're showing that the amount of, uh, the amount of activity of these antibodies on the virus. So you have these dose-dependent response curves again, where you show that there's a relationship between the amount of virus and the amount of antibody, and um, this shows it over time as well. You get some sense of the dynamics there. They also dive in a little bit into the structural biology here. Of course, antibodies work because they're interacting proteins on the molecular level, super tiny molecules, um, and it goes into how that functions and the areas of the proteins uh, of the virus that it's targeting. All right, Project Spotlight. So this is a project that we originally highlighted way back in the year review for AMIA. It's an awesome project um, headed by some great people. And the goal of this project is to make sense of the world's COVID data. Basically, it's a team of researchers who were you, looking at what was out there, papers being published every day, preprints being published, things just being put online willy-nilly. And they found it really difficult to make sense of any of this. They were motivated by their own research and expertise to try to make sense of this data. They found that typical information retrieval systems kind of were failing and that they had the ability to improve those systems by getting a bunch of people together to curate and contribute their expertise. And that's exactly what they did. They have gotten um, collaborations, uh, international collaborations to focus on this project. They've gotten 53 research groups to volunteer their time really kind of focus all of their efforts on producing really high quality information retrieval guidelines and systems so that our search, when you search for something important in COVID research or SARS-CoV-2, you find it effectively and quickly. That's the goal here. Um, and it's a really big effort. I encourage you to check it, check it out. Um, and we'll put up the URL to the website in the comments and you should um, definitely check out that project. They're starting round two right now. And so there's not too late to get involved with this project. They've recently published a paper, their first paper for the project, but there's gonna be more that outlines their approach and how they are designing better information retrieval systems to search through SARS-CoV-2 data. On the comments, there'll always be links to news articles and other readings that you can check out, and as well as shout outs that we couldn't get to. And remember to subscribe and you can catch us next week. All right, thank you for all your time. See you next time.